about here right now. In the very short term, we're in that frustrating pain trade. It's difficult to quench that thirst for yield given the very low level of treasury yields. As long as inflation remains contained overseas, you're going to see that global bond yields are going to remain low. No one's really defined what transitory is, least of all the Fed. It could last for a while longer, then it could start to impinge on consumer confidence. The idea, of course, is to get the unemployment rate back down to where it was before the next hit comes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. 117 on 10 from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Together this morning with Katie Lyons. Lisa back with us next Monday. Tom, this bounce this morning is unconvincing. Your equity market up a third of 1% on the S&P. There's still a bit in this bond market. Yields are coming in a couple of basis points. 117 yeah. on 10. I'm going to focus on the bond market. Johnny, equity market gives us joy. The VIX comes in from a 25 level in the sweat yesterday, negative 900 Dow points. We come into 21.89. Great. You're dead on. The 10-year yield, it continues ever lower this morning. That's a huge deal. Where does it leave the Fed next week, Tom? It leaves them, uh, you know, to be honest, I haven't thought much about it, John. I'm just looking at the market tick by tick. But to your point, I think it leaves them ever more dovish. And the ECB is the same way. Frankly, the market's doing for Jerome Powell all the heavy lifting. ECB this coming Thursday, news conference decision. <clears throat> coverage full right here on TV and radio here at Bloomberg. And Tom, the other issue we've got to talk about is the Delta variant and what it means for corporations and the decisions they'll make in the coming months. I thought it was really interesting to see our reporting <clears throat> on Apple. Apple delaying the return to office by a month reportedly, Tom. And I think that's significant. How do corporations respond? How do policymakers react? Yeah. And what's the reaction going to be of consumers as well through the summer? And I'm going to go to combine it with corporations and education as well. I don't know if they're going to wear masks on Blue Origin today, but I thought the federal judge decision on Indiana University, John, that should have been at the top of every newspaper nationwide. This is a federal judge that told Indiana's undergraduates and graduates, get vaccinated or don't show up to me that was the delta variant story yesterday you mentioned the space should we talk about it oh please should we do it should we promote it <laughs> yeah we do that it's now a huge deal let's promote Full it right coverage now. 8 30 eastern <clears throat> on tv radio quick take pretty much every single medium we've got here at bloomberg tom will be doing this what are you looking forward to tom as we get mr bezos alongside well, his brother an 82 year old I'm and gonna, a teenager I'm gonna going channel, to space. John, I'm going to channel the great novelist James Minchner, who wrote the book Space because he was so angry in the early 70s how all, everybody thought this was a lark. This is not a lark. Anytime you put anybody on top of liquid oxygen and liquid uh, uh, hydrogen, bad things can happen. What's needed here today is a safe return of these four individuals to Texas soil. You and I caught up this morning. I didn't get the sense of the happy talk that I've heard elsewhere, Tom from you. You're taking this a lot more seriously than some others are, at least. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that people do. I mean, I can bore everybody with a history of this and blah, blah, blah. But what's needed here is to understand is this is physics, it is science, and there's some real danger involved here. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom knew that before John Glenn orbited. And Mr. Bezos, you know, mentioned Yuri Gagarin uh, the other day. These are all people with risk involved. There is risk starting at 8.30 with our coverage this morning. And Kelly, the teenager gets all the attention <laughs> at the moment alongside Jeff Bezos and his brother. Can we talk about 82-year-old Wally Funk? I think that is the most awesome story out of everyone heading up there a little bit later this morning. I do too. I, I, I'm not sure if I would be willing to go to space at 82 years old, but for her, it has been a very, very long time coming, John. We're talking since the 1960s, and when Blue Origin made this announcement that she would be going, <coughs> I was filled with a pretty immense sense of pride for her, and it is very exciting that she will get to go, but the age differential between Wally Funk and Oliver Damon, John, 18 years old and you're already going up into space i'm not sure how your life can get any better out of that throughout your adult years the I feel youngest like you ever peak. the oldest ever a few stories out there in the mix some subplots for you a little bit later this morning as i say full coverage on tv radio and on bloomberg quick take as well let's check in on the price action right now equities do bounce but it's the smallest of bounces on the s p 500 up by around about a third of one percent of 42.64 and the nasdaq up by 0.35 percent and maybe that's what's been original recently about this sell-off the nasdaq did not sit it out the nasdaq participated in the downward move outside of that yield still heading lower we're down another two basis points 
price to 116.56 and euro dollar stable going into the ECB on Thursday. Katie, euro dollar 117.96. Indeed, John. And I wonder how much the economic data is really going to matter to this market today, given all the growth and Delta variant concerns that are out there. We do get some of it at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Housing starts and building permits for June. We did see home builder confidence yesterday falling to the lowest in about 11 months because of some of those rising material costs. So we'll see if that starts to weigh on residential construction. But also at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, of course, as you and Tom were just discussing, starts our special coverage of Jeff Bezos launching into space. That actual launch on a new Shepard spacecraft will happen at 9 a.m. Eastern time. The first manned mission for Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos will be going up past the Carmen line. And if that wasn't exciting enough, also after the bell, we get Netflix second quarter results. It's all going to be about the subscribers as it always seems to be likely subscriber growth is going to moderate in the second quarter as the world reopens. But it's really going to be about that forward view when Netflix reports after the closing bell. John. Looking forward to that and looking forward to the coverage from the team a little bit later this afternoon. Joining us now is Marvin Lowe, State Street senior global macro strategist. Marvin, what a 24 hours. What a couple of months we've had in this market. Mm -hmm. And we've got to start with where the 10 year is a 116 handle on tens, Marvin. What does 116 say to you? You know what? It, it's not only the 116, it's the fact that um, while we're, you know, certainly retracing a lot of this year's um, upward yield and rise, um, we have we have to put into perspective that real yields, the, the, the tips yield, is actually pretty much at the lowest that it's ever been. Um, so in combination, that tells me that we not only have growth fears, but we have questions about um, what the world looks like once we get through this. And, um, you know, we have to remember that before the pandemic, it wasn't as if the um, economy was in an incredibly solid place. Marvin, what is going to be the reaction of the last two, three days within what I call the trust money market, the very short-term paper, the wall of liquidity is out there. Clearly this morning, there's a safe haven feel to the 10-year yield. What are going to be the dynamics in the reverse repo market and even out to six months? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the reverse repo market, um, once the rates were raised uh, to five basis points um, during the last Fed meeting, saw a, a wall of money come into it. Um, that's going to continue uh, because that's that's a higher yield than ultimately you could find elsewhere. And um, you know, while while we kind of worry about uh, the Fed pulling back, they're not pulling back yet. There's still 120 billion that's being purchased. Um, there's other cash that comes in uh, because of the debt ceiling. So there's a lot of liquidity out there, which ultimately yeah. is somewhat supportive of the market. But it's finding its way into the Fed, and when it finds its way into the Fed to the reverse repo facility, it's not made available elsewhere. And John, this is so important because then I'll go back to Keynes when the facts change, I change. How is Jerome Powell going to change given this 10 year safe haven move to 1.175? Yeah, Tom, I would go even further. Marvin, I'm trying to work out what on earth this bond market is trading on. So many people come out and say, look, these moves, these prices aren't validated by the data. They've been saying that for months and yields yeah. have just carried on grinding lower. So at some yeah. point you have to sit here, respect and appreciate what a market is trading on. And I'm trying to work out, Marvin, what it is trading on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so I, I've been in the camp that um, ultimately, ultimately not, um, I'm not surprised by where yields ultimately are right now. Um, I think what it's saying is that uh, number one, um, the reopening process is not going to be as robust and enthusiastic as people thought, uh, you know, several months ago. Uh, we've priced in peak growth, so we really need, need to think about if we've been too aggressive around that. Um, and ultimately, um, whether or not the neutral rate, if you will, the, the, the Fed's long-term dot is appropriate in a world where if it looks like pre-pandemic, um, will look like pre-pandemic with a lot more savings and a lot more government debt, both of them somewhat um, somewhat uh, restrictive of yields being able to move higher. Marvin, I want to pick up on that bump in the reopening that you were talking about. What's the read through then to the equity market? Do you see a revival for some of that reopening kind of cyclical reflationary trade in the equity market happening anytime soon or is it dead in the water for now? Yeah, you know what, to, to, to me, there's still a lot of wood to chop in terms of deciding and, and understanding what this reopening looks like. If we kind of think about what the main catalyst for a lot of the excitement was, it was the Georgia elections. It was the fact that uh, fiscal was going to walk hand in hand with monetary. That is uh, certainly uh, in question. We'll get a lot more detail this week. Um, but the fiscal uh, response is probably weaker than, than we had thought kind of back in January or February, if you will. That leaves monetary alone. And we've seen that before. 
Um, so we've seen, uh, you know, yesterday NASDAQ wasn't as, you know, certainly um, participated in, in the downside the way the rest of the in equity indices did, but it's still outperformed and it has been outperforming now for the last six weeks or so. So there is a rotation kind of back to that safe defensive growth, if you will, that a lot of the large tech companies provide these days, uh, ironically, for the most part. Marvin, good to catch up. What a couple of days, what a Thank couple you. of months. Marvin Lowe there, State Street Senior Global Macro Strategist. Two's tens have gone from the highs of 157, pushing 160 at the end of March, down to 96 basis points wow. this morning, Tom. 100. That is a flatter curve. That is a flatter curve through 100, under a one percentage point a difference there. John, can you tell the difference in me this morning? What have you got going on? <clears throat> I'm wearing Bill Nye. You're wearing in Bill honor Nye. Of Jeff Bezos. Is that a bow tie from Bill That's Nye? That's a bow tie from Bill Nye. Thank okay. you, Mr. Nye. It's a just planetary to clarify. society bow tie, not just a normal Bill Nye. For those tuning in outside of America, Tom, can you just speak to the importance, the significance <laughs> of Bill Nye giving you a bow tie? For those on TV and radio worldwide, William Nye is the one who single handedly has led science forward. They make jokes about it, <clears throat> but particularly in an A science America, he's absolutely precious what he's done, John, day after day after day, explaining that science is something not to be afraid of. I would suggest Jeff Bezos agrees with him. Have you him. spoken to him this morning? No, I did not speak to Bill Nye. Have you but spoken I to him recently? Him. You're just no. channeling him through. No, your you know, I, to be honest here, in the Mercury Redstone Project, John, they put Ham the chimp, chimpanzee up. And Ham came back to Earth and lived and lived like a 30-year life. Bill Nye was talking about vet bill going up in space, and I said, no way. That's just too much risk. That would upset the children, Tom. It would. It would it's the price action, 42.69. That bill's not going into space. On the S&P 500, equity futures up 18, 19 points. We advanced four-tenths of 1%. But this bit in the bond market's going nowhere this morning. Yields are lower by a basis point or two to 117. 22 on tens. From New York City for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerrans. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has locked in plans for a cliffhanger vote today on whether to begin debates on the $579 billion infrastructure bill. Senators in both parties have not agreed on the measures yet. The vote puts pressure on the bipartisan group negotiating the measure, but Schumer also runs the risk of an embarrassing defeat. Now, the U.S. government is warning Americans to avoid traveling here to the U.K. That is because of a surge in coronavirus cases involving the highly contagious Delta variant. The warning came on the U.K.'s so-called Freedom Day when pandemic-related restrictions were lifted. Now, in Peru, a union activist from a Marxist party has been declared the winner of last month's presidential election. Pedro Castillo will take office next week. He defeated right-wing candidate Kiko Fujimori by a narrow margin. Costello ran on the slogan, no more poor people in a rich country. UBS posted better than expected earnings in the second quarter. The largest bank in Switzerland benefited from a jump in new assets and fee income. Still, UBS warned that it expects a slowdown in client activity during the third quarter. The bank has pivoted away from more volatile investment banking. It is now focusing on helping the rich manage their fortunes. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. understands that if we were to ever experience unchecked inflation over the long term, that would pose a real challenge to our economy. So while we're confident that isn't what we're seeing today, we're going to remain vigilant about any response that is needed. As I made clear to Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve when we met recently, the Fed is independent, should take whatever steps it deems necessary to support a strong, durable economic recovery. 
The President of the United States there from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning with Kenny Lyons. Lisa back with us on Monday. Let's check in on the price action after yesterday's sell-off across the board. It was an ugly one for the equity bulls. Futures this morning up 22, a bounce to 42.73 on the S&P, advancing a half of 1%. Bit still there in the bond market. Yields off a session low, 117.88. We're down about a basis point on the day. Outside of that in foreign exchange, <coughs> euro dollar 117.94, basically unchanged on the day two. Little bouncing crude back to 66, 66.80 on WTI, advancing their six tenths of 1%. It's been rough across the board in the last 24 hours, Tom, but the airlines just wow. We're 25% off the highs of April for the airline sector well, in America. It's, it's been that ugly. You know, good old all-American growth scare, and John, it just comes down to buy the dip or go to cash, and you know, clearly in the well, equity market. we know market, what you're doing, don't we? Well, yeah, I'm, com you know, I, I was painless yesterday. I thought you're it was comfortable. Good. Yeah, triple You've Just got to work out when to deploy it, Tom. Yesterday felt like, I'm looking That's for an trick. entry point, you know, I, you know, I'm... <laughs> the 3% gap from all-time highs isn't it's a doing correction. it for you. It's a, it's, no. a, it's, it's a mini, mini correction. I think that's probably a good way of summarizing it. It is, and, and we'll look at that uh, here this morning. Right now in Washington, and there's only one thing to talk about. It's buried in the Washington Post <clears throat> this morning, but it is a precarious infrastructure process, infrastructure legislation. Mm -hmm. Amory Horton is watching this, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Define precarious today. What actually, Amory, happens in the halls of Congress today is they precariously try to get to Wednesday. Well, they're trying to get Tom to Wednesday to get this uh, procedural vote to at least get the legislation. This is the bipartisan infrastructure package to the floor. And it's precarious because you have Republicans like Senator Susan Collins of Maine and Senator Rob Portman, who has uh, pushed for this infrastructure package, saying the timeline is just too tight. They do not have a hard copy of this legislation, and that will not bode well for the 10 Republicans Senator Schumer <coughs> needs to get this through the floor. The other side of Congress, Tom, the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she'll be meeting with her caucus, and they're going to be discussing the multi-trillion dollar spending, and the first time they will be discussing that since we got even a framework <laughs> and yeah. the full spending of that package, and they're trying to do this two-prong approach to make sure you got the moderates and the progressives on board, and that is why it is precarious Washington this morning. Well, you know, I, I just don't get this. I mean, a Senator Schumer of New York is clearly making uh, the, the idea that he wants both bills at the same time time that's original I, I don't remember that in my history books isn't it you do the first one then you do the second one I think that's more for a public relations, to be quite frank, because what you're going to see first on the Senate floor would be the bipartisan package. That So it really is that first and then the multi-trillion dollar spending second. But the negotiations, I would say, behind closed doors, that is really moving in tandem. This is where we all wanted to be. We wanted to be reopening the economy and thinking about these long-term policy decisions. And all of a sudden, Anne-Marie, we're thinking about the here and now and the third wave in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. How is the administration responding to all of this? Well, we heard from Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top infectious disease expert for the administration yesterday, saying that this administration is practically, he said, quote, pleading with people, speaking to David Weston yesterday. This administration is trying, Jonathan, to take a localized approach to get into rural areas and where communities just aren't vaccinated. This is going to be an uphill battle, though. I was looking at Axios just published this morning a fresh poll, and um, the uh, Ipsos president was saying that what's happening in this country right now is there's a small selection of people that are nudgeable. So it's about nudging those that are nudgeable, but there is a part of this country that even if you give them a number of benefits that this could be for or, you know, you don't have to go to work, there's a celebrity endorsement, would you take the vaccine? They are still saying no. So there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of communication uh, with uh, communities that refuse to get the vaccine because the Delta variant in these places we see are really starting to take hold. Do we have an access problem in this country anymore? Do we really still have an access problem? There is an access problem in the sense that you don't even have to go to a doctor's office and a physician. You can go to a local pharmacy. Uh, yes, these are more in like big uh, metropolitan areas. You can go to like a Duane Reed or a CVS. Uh, but, but in the rural places, what they are doing is they are sending in doctors. They are sending in basically RVs. Um, I don't think there's an access problem. There is a problem of people just wanting to mm -hmm. take up the vaccine. Another thing you have to think about is the fact 
fact that potentially there was this talk about Pfizer about a third booster that potentially could be needed with the Delta variant. We see Israel is doing that, mm -hmm. especially with those that are immune compromised. It's going to be very hard for this administration to get that third booster out when you have a lot of people in this country refusing to take up the first or second shot. Well, and that comes down to a misinformation problem as well, Anne Marie. The news that caught my attention overnight was Marjorie Taylor Greene, the first term Republican congresswoman from Georgia, getting suspended from Twitter for 12 hours because of tweets that were misinformation about COVID 19. And of course, we heard President Biden in the last few days saying that social media platforms are killing people by not monitoring this closer. Do you think we're going to see more specific concerted action from the administration or from Congress on that front? Well, President Biden yesterday actually walked back those comments. He said, I wasn't squarely saying Facebook is responsible for killing people. He said, I just had read a report, and a report did come out um, in the last 48 hours that talked about there are 12, a dozen people that are responsible for all of the misinformation that you are seeing across social media platforms. But the pressure is on for social media platforms to be very engaged when it comes to people putting up fake information regarding the vaccine. Also interesting, I think there's been a little bit of a tone shift um, with some partisan politics that play into the vaccines. We do have a representative, Buchanan, from Florida, Republican, who actually got COVID, even though he put out a statement yesterday saying he's fully vaccinated. He's now pushing for more of his constituents to take up the vaccine. You also heard from uh, a very conservative talk show host, Sean Hannity, overnight, pleading with Fox News viewers. Um, many say this is a partisan political issue in terms of the vaccinations. You could see that in the polls, saying that do all of your research, talk to your doctors, but the vaccines work. Amory Hordan, down in Washington, D.C., our Washington correspondent. Amory, let's catch up a little bit later. Thank you. Talking of this market and reopening and shutdown, Tom, we're back to that. We're talking about reopening stocks and stay-at-home <coughs> stocks and all of that. J.P. Morgan coming out and saying there's a 30 to 50 percent decline from the first quarter for some of these reopening names now. They're bullish. Let's be clear about that. The team in the past 24 hours upgrading the call on year-end on the S&P from 44 to 4,600 on the S&P 500 and pushing back against some of the gloom right. that we've seen in the past day. Michael Purvis with that yesterday as well, up to, I believe, to 4,800 as well. John, to me, it's a distinction between cases and deaths and, and Delta variant. You know, it's, it's, it's bad in the cases trend. The death trend maybe is not <clears throat> there yet, and we'll just have to see how it plays out. I'm trying to listen to experts. We'll talk policy with an expert next, Tom. Ian Bremer, Eurasia Group and G Zero Media President, joining us very shortly on this program, your equity market 42.70 on the S&P, advancing about 20 points, up almost a half of 1%. Bond yields come back in again by two basis points to 116.72. Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, together with Katie Lyons, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, here's the price action. Let's start with the S&P 500. Big correction. In the words of Tom Keane, a full 3% from all-time highs on the S&P. We're down about 22. We're up 22, rather, this morning. I'm used to saying we're down. We're up about a half of 1% on the S&P 500, advancing <laughs> on the Nasdaq by a similar amount. And after a big downdraft on small caps, we have not seen a new high there on the Russell since the middle of March. Small caps right now advancing 9 tenths of 1%. JP Morgan out with a call this morning. They're now looking for 4,600 year-end from 4,400. Nothing about this market is dissuading them from saying, you know what? Things are going to get worse. They think this market looks good and this market will continue to look good. Switch up the board and get to the bond over. market. Crisis over on tens, Tom. Yeah. Coming another basis point or two to 117.22 on 30s to about 182. Just to give you an idea of where we've come from, 174 at the highs on a closing basis at the end of March, all the way down to a 116 handle a little bit earlier this morning. Likewise, on the yield curve, we've gone from pushing 160 to sub 100 yeah. very, very quickly in just a handful of months. That's the story of the bond market. Let's get to the story of foreign exchange. This is one for Thursday. It's euro dollar and the dollar index. The dollar index right now pushing 93 again, 92.91. And it's going to be really interesting to see the pushback that we get from ECB President Christine Lagarde. They've got their new target now, Tom. It's not below, but close to 2%. It's 2%. It's going to be a big shift, isn't it, this coming yeah, Thursday? Yeah, I know you're looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I am. I, I think it's going to be really, really different. And, of course, yen plays in here at 109.41. And I'd also look at emerging markets. It's a bit off the radar, but emerging market, John, will be a challenge. Emerging markets have given me nothing this year. Yeah. The Nikkei's given me nothing yeah. this year. 
The Shanghai Comp has given me nothing this year. Right. That was the international story that was really meant to deliver in 21, Tom, and it hasn't. Yeah, well, we'll see. The Red, you know, and the Red Sox have given me nothing in the second half yet. They won last you night. You know how so. it feels then? Yeah, you know. For it, anyone being longer than EK this year, Tom. Pretty far. You feel that pain, I'm sure. Let us continue right now. We're going to go to Ian Bremmer here in a moment, Dr. Bremmer, on some of the international relations of the moment. But first, we must check in. He is on I-10. If you're in Arizona, you come out to New Mexico and you go ever east into West Texas and at the Clark Museum in Van Horn, Texas, is our Edward Ludlow this morning. Ed, I think something has not been discussed with Blue Origin. Within the Mercury Redstone program of Shepard, of Alan Shepard, and then Gus Grissom before Orbit, there was a stunning lack of pre-flight testing. We just did it seat of the pants back in the 60s and the 70s and the legitimate space race then. And here we've got major, major rocketry testing before we throw four people into orbit. How confident is this team of their propellant system? They're confident. There are a lot of executives in town last night in the bars and restaurants. They've always maintained that this stack, the actual booster and capsule that are flying today, would be tested as a pair twice before. They did that. And if those tests were successful, they would send up human beings. They argue it doesn't matter who's in the capsule because it's a fully autonomous process. What's so extraordinary, you mentioned the Mercury program. Bezos and co rocked up Friday, Saturday morning, have done two days of training, which has largely involved photo shoots and social media. I'm told they did go into a simulator. Uh, they have worked together on um, buckling and unbuckling their harnesses. But this is a fully autonomous process. All they have to do is sit in the seats, be sent up with 110,000 pounds of thrust, and when instructed, unseat themselves, do a somersault, buckle back up, and feel 5Gs of force on the way down. Well, they're going to have the five Gs of force on the way down and a little less on the way up, three Gs as well. And they are tourists. Uh, who decides if there is a challenge, if there is a problem to take the propellant from the capsule and escape from a rocket if something goes wrong? Who makes that decision? Yeah, the, the, the program director, the flight director will make that decision. He is the guy who goes through all of the checks. The safety me mechanism built into this system is that the capsule can separate from the booster pretty much at any time and propel itself away <coughs> to safety. Remember, it has the parachute system for landing. But let, there's no two ways about it, Tom. There is inherent risk in any launch. And mm -hmm. what I find so staggering is Blue Origin have only ever done 15 test flights in the company's history. You compare that with SpaceX, for example, they've done more than 120 on their single Falcon 9 booster alone. The ULA, that JV between Lockheed and Boeing, have done 140 flights. So they don't have a lot of data, a lot of past precedent for successful launch, but they're feeling confident today. Ed, this is one of the most divisive stories worldwide this very moment. We have enough problems right. on planet right. Earth, and here we are with the richest man in the world taking his brother, the wealthy kid, the wealthy teenager that gets right. a spot on this flight as well. And with the exception of maybe an aviation icon, a lot of people are just sitting here and wondering what on earth is going on? Why are we doing this? Ed, how is Jeff Bezos navigating those very, very highly critical questions of him and this mission? Well, I heard that there's a petition going around to keep Bezos up there uh, on the <laughs> Internet. No view on that. But one of the questions that, that Blue Origin and I have been going back and forth on is what is the benefit of this trip to society, to Van Horn, here in, here in Van Horn? They've not made any sort of direct investment in the town. I've asked them if they're going to offset the carbon, for example, because remember, Bezos and Amazon have this massive uh, net emissions goal for 2040 themselves. You know, these are questions they're facing. But I've also spoken to the heads of NASA. I've spoken to their biggest competitors in the industry, and none of them would say that this is a frivolous exercise. They actually think it's very important. Space is capital intensive. It needs public support for public sector funding. And basically, the view of NASA chiefs and of the private sector is that if this mission is successful, it just adds momentum behind all the space initiatives. It gives visibility to projects that need more money, you know. But the, the frank reality is this is just the tip of the iceberg for Blue Origin's ambition. They are behind schedule on all their other projects. They're trying to build engines for others that are behind schedule. They're getting beat by SpaceX on every single contract for NASA and the Pentagon. They got a lot of catching up mm -hmm. to do, but this would be a substantive step forward for their business. Ground control, back to Major Tom. Yeah, very, I, oh, I liked it. That's He's been fantastic. saving that up. Thank you, David Did you come Bowie. Up with that last and, uh, night, Ed? 
in I, uh, Van Horn, <laughs> Texas today. Uh, how do I come back from that? Well, best thing would be to go to Ian Bremmer. We do that right now, Dr. Bremmer, with Eurasia Group. There are 10 risks, and on that was not Cuba and not Haiti. Dr. Bremmer, I've got to go 232 miles, Havana, Cuba, to Miami Beach as well. Your thoughts as you and I study back 40, 50, 60 years on what the Biden administration must do of Cuba and Haiti. Well, uh, with Cuba, the Biden administration's in quite a box uh, because, as you know, the Democrats lost congressional seats in Florida uh, on the Cuba issue. And so they, they are very reluctant to be seen as doing anything that could create more opening uh, to the Cuban government, uh, even if that turns out to be the best way to ultimately bring down the Cuban communist regime. Um, and, uh, you know, they're looking at providing some vaccines. They're looking at potentially being able to provide Internet directly to the Cuban people. That would be seen as a hostile move by the government. Is probably the closest to a no-lose uh, that Biden right. can order if he's willing to. But short of that, there's really very little he can do. The sanctions are already there. The economy, of course, is in complete disarray. Um, the president of Cuba is trying um, to, he's turning to a more conciliatory tack. He's, he's uh, you know, allowed for uh, increase in, uh, you know, sort of goods and, uh, and, and hospital, uh, you know, sort of treatments and, and medicines to be allowed into Cuba um, and, and also made some changes uh, in small and medium enterprises, uh, lifting some of the regulations there. Uh, so he understands mm -hmm. that, that a, a significant violent crackdown would not work well on the island uh, and could, could potentially lead to explosive um, violence uh, on the part of the people. But I, I think that Biden's role is pretty limited. Uh, tell me about Haitian politics in the United States. I mean, we, I think we're all very much aware of Cuba and Florida. How does the domestic realities of Haiti fold into the Biden administration response? It's yet another refugee issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that we have larger numbers of refugees coming into the U.S., let's keep in mind, this is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they are, uh, there is uh, no functioning government right now. The sitting president, who the U.S. supported and who Biden supported, was gunned down overnight in his house by hired mercenaries, his wife, uh, in, in, in critical condition in hospital, the first lady. And Biden's response has not only been, we're not sending in troops or peacekeepers, but also, don't you dare get on boats, we will turn you around, right in our backyard. So for those that are criticizing, oh, the U.S. is leaving Afghanistan, the country's going to fall apart, and it's, you know, 10,000 miles away, um, if the U.S., uh, if this is the response to, the, to, to literally you know, right, right, right in our neighborhood, uh, one, one cannot expect uh, the U.S. Uh, to have a different response when we're talking about the Middle East or South Asia. Ian, do you think that this administration is getting a free pass? Do you think its treatment is equal to the treatment the previous administration got? Do you think that we've lowered the bar somewhat on what's acceptable now? Oh, um, well, it's clearly given an easier ride in terms of uh, journalists almost across the board are much happier with the Biden administration than the Trump administration. So some of that is bias um, and some of that is the incompetence of President Trump. Um, I mean, you know, how do you balance those things? I do think that if Biden were to start making some of the public statements that Trump made, um, objectively speaking, he would be, he'd have very different coverage than what we see right now. But also, let's keep in mind, uh, Biden saw no political benefit in referring to the media as the enemy of the people. Trump mm -hmm. did. He got off on that, and he thought it was useful for him politically. So he wanted the bad coverage. He wanted the fight because one of the only organizations that has lower approval in the United States 
then Congress is the mainstream media. And if mm -hmm. you want to pick a fight domestically, that's the fight that Trump thought was very useful. I, I understand the logic behind it. That coverage, that bad yeah. coverage was quite useful to his strategy. Ian, one area in which the Biden administration is not all too different from the Trump administration has been the approach to China. And we saw them, as well as the UK, other allies, pointing the finger at China for that Microsoft hack yesterday. China's response was, you're all ganging up on us. Is that true? Is it now the Biden administration and the rest of the Western world versus China? Is that coalition firm? The coalition is coming together. Uh, you know, what, what Biden's also treated better by allies uh, than Trump was. And in part, that's because Trump worked to antagonize allies. When your marketing strategy is America first, it's not meant for people outside the United States to like. That's, that's a, a, a feature, not a bug, to antagonize allies. Um, I think that Biden, you know, his orientation towards China overall is very similar to that of Trump. But Biden really wants a multilateral approach. And you saw that in spades yesterday when in the morning you have a joint statement. You have NATO, the EU, you have the Asian allies coming together with the United States saying China is a principal threat in terms of cyber attacks. We focused on Russia quite a bit, but this is by far the sharpest that the U.S. and almost the entire advanced industrial democratic community saying we've got a collective problem with China. I think there's a lot of backlash, and some of that has been Xi Jinping's leaning into pulling IPOs or pressure on IPOs of tech companies outside of China. Yep. Some of it has been the treatment of the Uyghurs and the reaction to the treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, and as you know, the EU-China investment deal has now been suspended. Um, some of it has been the unwillingness to be transparent over the origins of COVID. So, I mean, really, you know, whether we're looking at, at the pandemic, at technology, at trade, at domestic politics, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South China Sea, I mean, even climate, Ian, where the, we Chinese, run. the Russians are being more cooperative than the Chinese. From Eurasia, this is Bloomberg. value unquestionably but masks are not going at the root of the problem vaccination is uh, so we do not intend uh, mask mandate we do intend to double down on vaccination we'll be speaking about this throughout the week and beyond new approaches to vaccination because this is where we make the difference the mayor of new york city bill de blasio from new york city for our audience worldwide good morning alongside tom Keane, i'm jonathan farrow together this morning with kenny lines <laughs> lisa back with us this coming monday your equity market of 42.70 on the s p 500 advancing about 19 points we're up about four tenths of one percent outside of that yields are lower a 116 handle on tens to 116.89 down a couple of basis points euro dollar just slightly negative now euro dollar down by 0 0.14 percent that's a weaker euro at 117.84 and the bounce just about holds in crude. 66 handle, $66.63. We are positive there, Tom, about a third of 1%. Yeah, the bond market jumbles when I'm going to be watching forward here in the next two hours. Let's get to the pandemic right now and the Delta variant. He has been of such uncommon value to us. Amish Adalja joins us from Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Amish, I just looked at the logarithmic death slope of the United States and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom... Ver vector is not good. It's higher. It is not surging, but it's certainly in some form of direction that would be called worse. Can the Delta variant reality change the vector of deaths in America? If you look at the country overall, I don't think it will change the vector that much. But certainly in certain states, certain counties where there are enough high-risk individuals that are not vaccinated, it may change the, the death vector there. Because what that's going to really depend upon is what level of those individuals at highest risk for death have been vaccinated. And that number is higher than the general population in general. So if you look at people above the age of 65 nationally, it's about 80% are fully vaccinated. But there's going to be some baseline level of death, and that may fluctuate depending right. upon if there is cases with Delta. Percolating, Dr. Adalja, is the requirement that the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, may make a public announcement to his constituencies get vaccinated like I got vaccinated. How important would it be for President Trump to say, let's go? It can only help. We, we know that 
of, through his administration, there were many failures on this pandemic. But one thing that is a success is Operation Warp Speed. So this is something he rightly deserves credit for, for, for all of the pre-purchase agreements, for getting a vaccine coordinated and delivered within a year. All of that is is something good that happened from his administration. And we know that it's, if you look at the voters, it's, it's actually counties that he won where these vaccination rates are low. So I do think it might be able to, to, to move the needle, uh, so to speak, in with his supporters. However, I think there is still probably about 15% of the population that's not gonna get yeah. a vaccine and it might be too little too late. Did you hear that doctor humor, John? Dr. Adelja there, just move I the missed needle. That, get that. I, I missed that. I'm not move sure if that was in, intended by little the doctor. medical humor. Dr. Adelja, Shelly Banjo, our bureau chief here in New York City, wrote a piece yesterday about how much vaccination rates in New York City vary by race. And here are some of the numbers. 69% of Asian New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. Only 30% of black New Yorkers are vaccinated. Do we have an access issue? Is it an, an outreach issue? What kind of issue do we have here, doctor? It's probably more of an outreach than an access issue because you can get vaccinated on the subway in New York City. It's very easy to get get uh, a vaccine. But w this is where I think that door-to-door -door campaign might help, especially if you use trusted community members, primary care physicians that are going around and vaccinating people that want to be vaccinated that haven't gotten around to it. That might be something that will increase the uptick, but but there clearly is a discrepancy among certain populations, and it's less about access. It's about maybe education and and having the ability to ask questions about the vaccine. That I think needs to be part of the next phase of, of moving those people who have hesitated to get the vaccine uh, into the ranks of the vaccinated. Doctor, speaking of the next phase, we always talked about cases last year. Then we talked about the need to focus on other things: healthcare capacity, deaths, hospitalizations. Do you feel like the way that these numbers are being reported right now, we're doing it with the correct emphasis? Do you think that's the case? No, I still don't think it's the, the correct emphasis. Cases are still very much prioritized over everything else. That's why you're seeing a lot of news out of Los Angeles County, which is really not in a problem with hospital capacity, but has cases. What I think has to be kind of drilled into the public and into the press is that cases are always going to be there because this is, an, this is a virus that tr transmits efficiently. It's not eliminable. It's not eradicable. Our goal was to tame the virus, remove its ability to put hospitals in crisis. And for the most part, it's, we've done that in the United States with some notable exceptions like Springfield, Missouri. But it is something that I think isn't fully hasn't fully been swallowed by the American public that, you know, 10 years from now, they're going to be COVID cases. We're just not going to be threatened with COVID the way that we are, we, we have been in the past and, and are, are in some parts of the uh, country currently. So if cases aren't a problem and if hospitalizations and the death rate isn't going up, do policymakers just get to sit by and allow the economy to proceed as normal in reopen or would you be advocating for any more restrictive measures here? I wouldn't be advocating for restrictive measures. I do think it's important that health departments and the CDC issue guidance on how to do things safely. You know, throughout this pandemic, they kind of had this abstinence only approach. Don't do this, don't do this, and, and not how to make things safer. So I think when, as we have cases, I think there will be kind of a toolbox that people can use if they're not vaccinated to minimize the risk of things about for, un, for, for unvaccinated people wearing masks when they're indoors and, and, and how to think about certain areas where there might be more transmission versus less transmission. And I think that's gonna be important, just like we do for other infectious diseases, like for flu, for HIV. That type of guidance, which is voluntary and provides people a toolkit to be able to navigate the world with an infectious disease in it, that's going to be very useful. But I don't think that restrictive measures are going to be something that we see uh, wide, widespread adoption of here, or I, nor do I think they're necessary. I mean, in general, public health likes to use voluntary measures and give people recommendations. This was sort of an aberration which happened during COVID-19. Doctor, good to catch up as always. Come back soon. Dr. Amish Adalja, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security Senior Scholar. Just talking about where we are in this moment, Tom, it just feels like we're taking a small step backwards on several fronts. This path towards reopening and getting back to work. Getting back to work was the next big step. We were talking about September. Now the likes of Apple reporting yeah. pushing that back a month. I just wonder what happens with the banks here on Wall Street, an aggressive push on their side, if you want to characterize it that way. It will be interesting to see if they change things. Yeah, I totally agree, John. And what I'd also look at, if it's not dying and the drama of dying, it's a level of illness from this Delta variant and how that plays into back to school. I mentioned the Indiana University uh, federal case yesterday. There's other cases like that in process right now, but forget about that. What about high schools? What about elementary schools and the yep. Delta variant? And then for this market, Katie, it was the first time in a long time that I heard so many people talking about stay-at-home stocks. <laughs> 
and reopening stocks. That was yesterday. Yeah, the hotel index and the city benchmark of global reopening stocks, John, is basically at the same level year to date now after the outperformance we saw for some of that travel reopening play earlier on. And it, it, it seems that the conversation has moved from fear about inflation and the growth coming out of this pandemic was going to fuel inflation. Now just back to straight up growth fears. And are we going to slow because of this Delta variant? And I think that's what you are seeing in the bond market, John. Yesterday was ugly, a bit of a bounce this morning. Katie Lyons, Tom Keane, Jonathan Ferro, your equity market up 18 points on the S&P, advancing to 42.69. Coming up, it's the big bull on Wall Street. It's Michael Purvis of Tallback and looking for 4,800 year end on the S&P cool. 500. We're going to do that next on TV, on radio, for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg. here right now in the very short term we're in that frustrating pain trade it's difficult to quench that thirst for yield given the very low level of treasury yields as long as inflation remains contained overseas you're going to see that global bond yields are going to remain low no one's really defined what transitory is least of all the fed it could last for a while longer than it could start to impinge on consumer confidence the idea of course is to get the unemployment rate back down to where it was before the next hit comes this is bloomberg surveillance with tom keen jonathan farrow and lisa abramowitz a small bounce in the equity market from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning with Katie Lyons. Lisa back with us this coming Monday. Your equity market looks like this, up 18 on the S&P to 42.69. Tom, is a small bounce, but this bond market's still firm. Yields are lower by two basis points yeah. to 116 on tens. Maybe a surprise here. You'd look for higher yields along with a recovering VIX, a recovering Dow up to a print of 34. A thousand. We're going to talk SPX with Michael Purvis in a moment, John, and his enthusiasm. Instead, the headline today is the bond market safe haven, lower yields. And yet it's done nothing to lead the equity bulls to throw in the towel, Tom. You mentioned Michael Purvis. He goes to 4,800 year end on the S&P. JP Morgan goes to 4,600 from 4,400 on the S&P. The equity bulls are still bullish. They're going to get out front of earnings. David Wilson is steeled to cover earnings, not so much this week, John, but into the tech juggernaut next week. And then after that, and I would suggest these houses led by Purvis are getting out front and tweaking higher. Maybe we'll see a lot more of that. And Katie, after the close, after the bow. Netflix. Second quarter results, John. It's all going to be about the subscriber numbers, which, yes, I know we always say for Netflix. But what, to what extent has the pulling forward of demand bled into the second quarter as well when you're thinking about the fact that people were stuck on their couches? They didn't have anything better to do than to binge TV shows and movies on Netflix. That story is now changing. And what the picture is going to look like going forward, I think, will be interesting and could set the tone for some of these other tech giants as well in terms of what they are seeing as demand uh, maybe wanes in a reopening world. I just get the inside look, Kate from the Tom Keen household. Tom, <laughs> quick question for our Netflix shareholders. Have you been using Netflix less, recently? Less, less. Why less, less, Tom? It's the pandemic is over. Less. You're getting out and doing stuff. Marginally less, yes. You don't like the content slate right yeah, now. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot to that. I think Variety has done a great job. Uh, Claudia Eller over there has done a great job of the production process in Hollywood. And I would suggest from reading Variety, John, that it's way behind and they are desperate for new product. John, Friday, Ted Lasso. <laughs> new season. Apple TV. I saw yes. that. I saw that. Richmond still looks watch good. still going to the first season, Tom. I, I you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Graylish up at, 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 at where's he? Avon Old Ast Farms? Aston Villa, Aston Tom. Aston Villa. <laughs> Avon, Avon Old Farms. Avon Old Farms. Okay. just making up football clubs no, now. No, hockey, that's Connecticut, John. But, you know, I, I look, John, at Jack Graylish, and he could go to Richmond, and that would be a big improvement. I think Ted Lasso had really developed the player, Tom. Yeah, Let's move on. Your equity Let's market, 42.69 on the S&P. <laughs> equity futures up four tenths of 1%. Into the bond market we go. Yields come in a couple of basis points on tens to 116.56. Commodities look like this. Crude firmer by a third of 1% to 66.63. And going into the ECB this coming Thursday, your euro is weaker. Your dollar just a touch stronger. Euro dollar. Katie Lines, euro dollar 117.81. 
a stronger dollar for a fourth day, John. Of course, we have a bunch coming up today as well at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Not only is it the start of special programming here on Bloomberg Television, you, Tom, and the team taking us through that uh, Blue Origin Jeff Bezos launch. We also are getting some economic data, housing starts, and building permits for last month. How much are rising materials costs really weighing on construction in the residential sector? And then, of course, at 9 a.m. Eastern Time is when Jeff Bezos will actually blast off to space in that new Shepard rocket, the first uh, manned launch for Blue Origin. Origin, Jeff Bezos, his brother, an 82 year old Wally Funk and an 18 year old kid from Denmark. Quite the crew we will be watching head off past the Carmen line in just a few hours time. And finally, after the bell, we were just talking about it. John Netflix reporting second quarter results, watching for not only the second quarter subscriber numbers, but the subscriber forecast going forward. That is the stock up 71% over the last two years, but not necessarily as strong in 2021. John, let's just sit on that for a moment. Kelly, and thank you, Tom, the first manned trip for this Blue Origin New Shepard rocket. Can you just walk me through that, Tom, how significant that is? It's significant any time men are involved, and women for that matter, as well. John, what happens with men is you get the simpler systems, and you can go right down to the rocket nozzle at the bottom of the BE-3 engine. It's everything is about simpler, 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 and I'm not gonna mince words. What haunts everyone is the Apollo accident with Gus Grissom years ago, and of course, the Challenger blow up where people were trying to get simpler, and they blew it with complexity for whatever reason. And the whole focus when you put men and women in space is simple systems win. Do you think fully autonomous and going in that direction, Tom, do you think that makes it um, simpler? Yeah, I, I think it does. I think it does. And I think, John, you've really brought up the heart of the matter. The people that want to romanticize this and compare and contrast with the right stuff, the number one variant is not the rocketry or the, the, the plastics and all that. It's the computer system are so dramatically superior now that when we hear it's all going to be done by computers, there's no pilot, there's really no control central, you know, remote control and all that. Uh, you know what? The computers do it, and the computers are probably more reliable. The full coverage starts right here at 8.30 Eastern in about 85 minutes from now. Let's turn to this equity market. The bulls are still bullish. There's your headline. Michael Purvis is one of them. Tall back on capital. Advisor, CEO, and founder. Michael, you go out to 4,800 on the S&P from where we are, on futures at least, at 4,270. Michael, why? Well, I think I, I step back and I first look at uh, where uh, the earnings trajectory is going to be. Not this year. We all know there's been fantastic earnings growth off uh, 2020. But into 2022, uh, I think the, the, the trajectory is likely uh, to, to, to be really pretty robust. When I get to 4,800, um, I really am solving for not just uh, a valuation that makes sense, but particularly uh, uh, the equity risk premium here. And not you know, I, as you know, since late March, I've been very sort of bullish on the 10-year Treasury note, and I have this slightly neurotic view that 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 the uh, you can be bullish Treasuries and equities uh, at the same time, and 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 even reflation equities. Uh, there, I'll get into that in a second. But but uh, when I look at uh, prospectively, I look at uh, where how the market's going to trend. Um, you know, you have an earnings stream that's balanced. Um, on one hand, by you know, 40 percent of the index, uh, referring to the S&P 500, with large cap tech earnings, secular growth uh, that has been remarkably stable, remarkably strong, remarkably consistent, um, and then of course, you know, nominal GDP between this year and next year uh, combined, you're looking at 16 percent. That's really remarkable. Um, uh, you haven't seen that kind of uh, sort of two-year collective nominal GDP story since the. the 1980s, um, and certainly not the few years before COVID. So you have a cyclical earnings stream um, uh, that's going to be really robust. You've got, and you've got, uh, if that underperforms, you've got large cap tech that's still right. going to be quite robust. Michael, tell me about the denominator of all the ratios. The pros look at ratios. They don't look at single point. Earnings to the rescue, revenues to the rescue, margins to the rescue. Can you tell me that there's going to be such denominator strength that we've got value here at your 4,800 SPX? Well, the, the, I, I think the way, you know, we're all trained to look at value on the S&P 500 or other equity indices at, in terms of PE multiple. I, I think the, the game really needs to shift to equity risk premium. In other words, the difference between the prospective nominal earnings yield 
and the 10-year treasury rate. I think that's really kind of much more where the game is going for S&P valuation. Um, it's a little bit more complex because you have to make a judgment about where the 10-year yield is going to likely to be um, in the future um, and where that earnings trajectory is likely to be. Um, and, and, and then you can, I think, back, back into reasonable valuations. Would I do that? And I sensitize um, earnings growth into next year um, against a backdrop of different uh, uh, interest rate assumptions. Um, I, I think you can make a pretty reasoned case that 4,800 at the end of the year is, 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 is really quite achievable. Um, you know, again, the, uh, if we do have, uh, if, if the economy underperforms, the trajectory of, of the economy underperforms, um, and, and this earnings season, uh, if we see yeah. evidence of that, this is an earnings season and so forth, are we, are, um, again, I think that's, that uh, you do have large cap tech to fall back on. But I also, there's an important point also here. We will get earnings misses related to, to, to um, supply chain issues. We will get, um, you know, there is this persistent COVID cloud there. But I think yeah. what's really important right now in midsummer is that is that some of this will ultimately defer growth into 22, which is exactly what the equity market needs right now is to see a stronger 22 story. Um, and I think Michael. that's going to be happening. Will the path up to 4,800 be more volatile? We have a VIX north of 20 again. Is it going to stay there? Look, you know, we bounced crisply off the 50-day moving average yesterday. That's been working support uh, over the last several months. Um, I think uh, I think a lot of this volatility that we've seen is is, is really a function of trying to understand the narrative uh, or, or what the bond market is trying to say. And I think. The um, I, I, again, I look at the ten-year Treasury as sort of much more reflect, a reflection of Fed poli likely Fed policy over the next several years than than an indictment of economic growth in the in the next 24 months. Uh, there, um, so that process um, of uh, of sort of the reflation story on the equity side decoupling from the interest rate prices you see on your screen it is inherently volatile. I think we will get through that. I think. We should, probably should expect to see some more volatility, but I don't think we have a lot of complacency built into the equity options market. Well, it's been a volatile um, 24 right hours, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mike, it's going to catch up yes. on that new call. Thanks for bringing it to us. Michael Purvis there, tall back in capital advisor, CEO and founder. In your bond market right now, in two basis points, Tom, to 116 yeah. on tens. We just keep grinding lower. And the 210 spread is what the pros look at, that difference in yield between 210 and 96 uh, base point. John, this is a real surprise this morning, given the equity lift. The sub 100, what does that mean for the financials? We'll dig into that a little bit later with Alicia Levine of BMY Mellon. And wealth management. Yes. Looking forward to that. Tom King, Jonathan Ferro, together with Katie Lines this morning. Your equity market, 42.68, positive four tenths of a one percent. From New York City, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerrans. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has locked in plans for a cliffhanger vote today on whether to begin debate on the $579 billion infrastructure bill. Senators in both parties have not agreed on the measure yet. The vote puts pressure on the bipartisan group negotiating the measure, but Schumer also runs the risk of an embarrassing defeat. Now, the U.S. government is warning Americans to avoid traveling here to the U.S. UK. That is because of a surge in coronavirus cases involving the highly contagious Delta variant. The warning came on the UK's so-called Freedom Day when pandemic-related restrictions were lifted. UBS posted better than expected earnings in the second quarter. The largest bank in Switzerland benefited from a jump in new assets and fee income. Still, UBS warned that it expects a slowdown in client activity during the third quarter. The bank has pivoted away from more volatile investment banking. It is now focusing on helping the rich manage their fortunes. An e-commerce platform for barbecue grills and related products backed by retired American football stars Eli and Peyton Manning is going public. BBQ Guys is merging with Velocity Acquisition, a black check firm. The transaction values the company at $963 million. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120. Countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg.
what we're seeing now in this country is a significant uptick in infections, particularly in those areas of the country, those states, cities, regions, counties that have a very low level of vaccination. And that's the reason why we are practically pleading with people to please, if you're not vaccinated yet, seriously consider getting vaccinated. And Dr. Anthony Fauci there from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Kelly Lines this morning. Lisa, back with us on Monday. So she says. I think she is, Tom. <laughs> I think she's committed that. I think she might have run I out think, of vacation she, now. Yeah, well, I think she needs another week. And a Your equity weeks. market up 20. We advance a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. Outside of the equity market, into the bond market, that's where your headlines have been. Yields are lower by a basis point or two again to 117. We had a little look at 116 in the last couple of hours. 117.38 right now. In the FX market, euro dollar slightly negative. Negative 0.15%. That's a weaker euro going into the ECB this Thursday. 117.82. The ECB, put that in your diary for Thursday. Put this in your diary for the next hour. In just under an hour from now, in a small town in West Texas, just outside of that, Tom, the astronauts to be. Should we call them that, Tom? <laughs> the astronauts to be? Yeah, I, yeah. We'll leave the astronaut training center and head to to the launch pad in about one hour from now, Tom. For those on radio and as on TV as well, as we see an image in the dark of the West Texas night, it is stunning how small this rocket is. This is the first stage of a Glenn model, which will go up in a number of years, John, and it's only 60 feet tall. This is not Saturn V launching to the moon. It is not the ginormous size of getting something as large as a space shuttle up there. It's a lovely little project and really harkens back to the 60s. And that tower you can't quite see, Tom. The astronauts will ascend that tower at about 8.30 Eastern they time. Do. Once they get the get-go, they will ingress into the crew capsule. The hatch oh, will close oh, ingress. at Very good, John. 8.36 Eastern. Do you like <laughs> this? Good. Got a play-by-play -play just for you, Tom. And then it is takeoff at 9.00. Eastern. It's just they walk up the gantry, which is interesting because it's just I, I can't emphasize this enough, John. We have all these images from our Ute, and this is a lovely small project to go 63 miles uh, into space. And we will see that Emily Chang is down there with our team. I don't know where Ed Ludlow is. He is he in New Mexico? I think he's in that little town in West Texas, Tom. Yeah, I think that's good. where he is. See, you're going back. You've been reading Marty Robbins here. You've been looking at Marty Robbins' lyrics here about West Texas. I think Texas. he had a night out last night and didn't quite make it to the training yeah, facility. I think that's what it was. Good for Jack, Ed Ludlow. Jack Great Fitz, color, though. Jeff Fitzpatrick had a night out last night in Washington as well and joins us now, our Bloomberg government reporter. Jack, while we're here, there's so many serious things to talk about. How, where does space fit in on Capitol Hill? Does anybody care about it, or is it some presidential moment every four years where they decide we're going to Mars and everybody gets lathered up for one week? What is it? It, it is something to care about. It's, it may be something they care about once every four years or so. Uh, the Blue Origin stuff, for one reason or another, has not uh, sort of fixed itself in the center of the conversation in Washington about space. But NASA has big enough plans so that it, it's a, a real topic of conversation. Maybe one thing to look out for is, do they stick to uh, NASA's current plan of trying to put people back on the moon by 2024? I know there were some Democratic lawmakers who thought that former President Trump picked that for political reasons because he'd like to still be in office when they do it. Now that Biden is in office, I am hearing less uh, resistance to the 2024 date from Democrats, uh, which may be a, a little bit politically motivated as well. But uh, that's that's the expensive route is to go there by 2024. So they're, they're definitely talking about NASA's plans. Many people are hopeful about the progress we can make by doing things like this, Jack. Other people are very critical of an event like the one taking place in about 90 minutes' time, 100 minutes' time. How does this play into, if at all, into the whole debate around wealth inequality in this country? It definitely does play into that. There's some vague uh, rhetoric about sending billionaires to space. I would not be surprised to see this sort of as an anecdotal reference in some of the tax debate. Uh, but again, it, it, there it really NASA has its own plans to such a significant degree that the debate over space itself 
in Congress, at least that I've seen, uh, hasn't really gotten into the the private sector stuff on space. They're, they're really focused on their own thing. But in terms of wealth inequality, yeah, you're, you're probably going to hear this be a talking point with Bezos and Branson and, and the, the richest people in the world uh, having their own plans to go to space. Jack, Tom Keene is wearing his Bill Nye bow tie today, and he was telling us earlier about the importance Bill Nye had in recognizing science and trusting in science, and that is a conversation that is applicable to the vaccine as well. Tom now showing off said bow tie, but when it comes to the vaccine, Jack, obviously the Biden administration missed its goal on July 4th. We are now six months out from the inauguration. Is this where the Biden administration thought we would be at this point? I think it, we may have slowed down the progress of vaccinations a little faster than they thought, given that we missed the July 4th date. Clearly, we are uh, still at a moment where there's progress to be made. There's a significant gap between the percentage of people who have at least one shot and the percentage of people who are fully vaccinated. So we're, we're still in progress. Uh, but when you hear the kind of tone that you heard from Dr. Fauci, the, the plea tone, you can see that's a reflection of there are a number of people who are pretty stubborn and pretty set in not getting a, a vaccine. And it has become a very politicized thing. There was a, a CBS News poll that came out yesterday that showed the people least concerned about the Delta variant are the ones who are not vaccinated. Uh, and, and there really is a partisan gap there. So we're, we may not be at the point where we've hit the wall, but we're getting close to it at this point. Jack, a lot of people have fed this narrative that these are all Trump voters who don't want the vaccine because the president was against science. I do wonder whether there's a correlation between the people that voted for the former president and also are quite heavily anti-government and how that plays into some of the thinking down in D.C. Yeah, that's a significant factor. Uh, the, you know, you, it's hard to uh, parse out the exact reasoning. We can tell at this point that there is a partisan divide, uh, but how much of that comes down to skepticism that Joe Biden is telling you to get vaccinated, uh, the relatively low numbers of Republican leaders, although some, like Mitch McConnell, have been very vocal about uh, you, you needing to get a vaccine, um, how much does it come to anti-science, how much does it come down to, at this point, we have a pretty conspiratorial tone in a lot of uh, political media, at least non-traditional political media. Yeah. So I don't think it's as simple as saying a bunch of Republicans are anti-science. Uh, there are a lot of things that play into it. But unfortunately, at this point, uh, based on all the polling we've seen, based on talking to politicians, it, it does come down to, a, at this point, a pretty significant partisan gap between Democrats and Republicans. It's never that simple. Jack is going to catch up. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter. As far as the Blue Origin New Shepard launch is concerned, T-95, I think, TK. T oh, minus 95 until T the launch. We're going to do that through the next 95 minutes. <laughs> well, it's going to be fun, isn't it? We'll talk yeah. about the criticism as well. I think there's some criticism out there that we have to acknowledge. Yeah, and, and there's some real science going on here. This is a different trip and should be of interest. There's From some New real York risk City, there. this is Bloomberg. from New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. Here's the price action this Tuesday morning. 42.73 on the S&P. We bounced back about 22 points, advancing a half of 1%. That's the S&P 500. Here's the Nasdaq advancing about 0.46%. And a Russell, after getting hammered more recently, advancing about 9 tenths of 1%. And here's your headline from JP Morgan. The slowdown fears are premature one. They are overblown, too. They're looking for 4,600 year rent on the S&P. They raised their forecast from 44 after the events of the last 24 hours. Switch up the board and let's talk about the bank, shall we? This is the scene pre-market, just edging a little bit higher, up four-tenths of 1% on JP, on Bank of America, up six-tenths of 1% on City, up a half of 1%. From the highs of June, we are down 13% on the S&P 500 banks. Worth talking about the sector as a whole, as a basket. And what this bond market means for all of this. Let's finish on this bond market. Twos, tens and thirties look like this this morning. 118.37 on tens. And that yield curve, that spread, that difference between twos and tens, Tom, 
sub 100. If you're sub 100, <clears throat> can you make that bank's trade work? You know, what's going to make the bank trade work? I agree, John. Traditional banking here at risk and also the movement of short-term money in the overnight repo market as well. What else do you have, John? That's it. That's all I've got for you, Tom. <laughs> what else do you want? I don't know. Give some me some special equities. space Give me coverage. Some there, We're going to do stocks. that at 8.30 Eastern. Kaylee Lyons has the stocks for you, Tom. Sure. Hello, Kaylee. Hey, John. OK, I want to start with one stock. That is IBM because this is off of a fundamental earnings story reported after the bell last night. The best sales growth this company has seen in three years since going all the way back to 2018. The reason why is cloud computing, really a vindication of the new CEO Arvind Krishna's strategy to shift more towards that business. As a result, the stock is up the better part of 4 percent this morning. And John, you have been all over the travel story, particularly for the airlines as a basket. The airlines off by a quarter since their peak in April. But we are seeing a bit of buying the dip coming in in this space today in keeping with what we're seeing in the broader equity market. Royal Caribbean, Delta Airlines, each up the better part up 2%. One story we haven't talked about yet, though, Tom, and this one is for you. Bitdog, under $30,000, a very closely Prices. watched level <clears throat> when it comes to some of the technical uh, strategists eyeing the moves in Bitcoin. Yeah. As a result, that is weighing on some of those crypto tied equities in early hours, right? Blockchain, Marathon Digital, Coinbase each down in the ballpark of one and a half to even nearly 3% in the case of Marathon Digital, Tom. I'm glad you bring it up. I did a technical analysis of Bitcoin this morning. It's not our job to give an opinion on what we see, <clears throat> but I'll be blunt. It's teacher course negative, and we'll see how that goes. It is all sorts of enthusiasm up and then spikes down. And now some real giveaway here at 30,000. Bitcoin, 29,643 right now. We'd like to check in with Mark McCormick with TD Bank, Global Head of FX Strategy, Emily Chang coming up from West Texas here in a bit. Mark McCormick, on currency, what is the character of this dollar rally? You've been very good about it. Is it a dollar rally that is of stability or can it really move dollar strong? Yeah, thank you. I, I think right now it's it's just much more tactical. It has to do with the the global reflation trade. There's a little bit too much opt much optimism that was priced in starting in May. We're starting to see some uh, cooling global mobility trends, which means reopenings are pausing a bit. The flatness of the global yield curve and the U.S. curve is also very important for the strength of the dollar, uh, largely, again, because that consists with what's happening on the reflation side. Central banks are turning much more hawkish just as the global cycle is peaking. So peak stimulus, peak inflation, peak growth, all these things are happening at backdrop where uh, tactical positioning and asset yeah. allocation is all positioned for risk. You write of confusion in the summer of 2021. Define the confusion is exemplified through currency pairs. Right. I, I think a lot of it has to do around global reflation, U.S. exceptionalism. We have been swinging on both sides of this pendulum basically since COVID. And I think a big part of the confusion is really around which driver should we be watching. I know there's a tremendous amount of emphasis on the Fed and the impact the Fed will have on the global currency market. But I think what uh, participants continue to forget is the global growth story is the primary driver for the dollar. So there's an element that we can play relative central bank policy, we can play relative growth, we can play relative terms of trade, relative equity momentum, but none of those give us a clear, consistent signal on which currency pairs to buy. So therefore, we get a backdrop that is much more tactical, where it's like you look for a currency pair that looks mispriced on some of those factors, and then you hold that trade for maybe four to six weeks, maybe if you're lucky, a couple of months. Uh, but then you got to move on from that and find a new factor and a new set of currencies that work in a new regime. Uh, and that's where the confusion lies, because we are in an oscillating market, not a trending one. So, Mark, this is important. A lot of people are looking for that big directional play on synchronized global growth. Are you saying it's not going to develop? Well, I think the backdrop is very st – it's still positive for cyclical assets. But the pricing, I think well, when we talked about this before, we talked about the rise, uh, the wall of worry rising in May. Then we talk about a hawkish Fed in June. July, now we actually realize those risks along with what we've seen is the peak in global data surprises, the peak in global growth expectations. Those things were cresting in May and June, and now we have the validation that those indicators have now peaked, and they're reversing. Um, and a big part of it, again, we have summer liquidity, but we also have the Delta variant and the worry that it'll have on mobility. And again, the global mobility indicators we track show that there's divergence across countries. The UK is a great story. Sterling's a, another one to kind of look at in this context, where Euro Sterling is rallying largely because the Bank of England was hawkish on inflation, but UK growth was never really living up to a story where you'd want to buy the currency on growth. 
So again, the element here is we should be focused on the global reflation trade that yep. it still has a long way to go because the Fed will probably hike two years after tapering in December. Uh, but everything's mispriced right now, so we got to go through price discovery mechanisms. Well, help us understand the relationship between what happens with the U.S. dollar and rates. And, Mark, let's make it really simple. Right now, the dollar index pushing 93. Last time we were near these levels, the U.S. 10-year was around 170. Right now, this morning, sub-120. What is the relationship between this U.S. dollar and what happens with yields? Yeah, it's very important because uh, it's, it's definitely an element of real yields. But I think the most important driver for the dollar right now is the shape of the U.S. and the global yield curve, which are moving in the same direction. When we had U.S. exceptionalism during the Trump years, we had a stronger dollar. We had a steepening U.S. yield curve. We had a flattening global curve. Now we're getting a flattening U.S. curve and a flattening global curve largely because central banks are turning more hawkish, two-year rates are rising. At the exact same time, the 10-year rates are coming down on the global growth story. So the, you know, the, the, miss, the, under, the lack of certainty around each of those two factors is bullish for the dollar because the flattening of the global yield curve signals that we're just not getting as much reflation or the markets have to figure out what's, uh, yeah. you know, what the next move is. If that's bullish for the dollar, Mark, how bearish is it for EM? It depends on the context, and that, that's a good point because, you know, there's a part of the EM where U.S. real rates are still moving lower, you know, so, so for the 10-year moving back to 1.3 percent should be bullish for EM, but EM selling off very aggressively, again, because the global story is what's driving a lot of these factors and commodities have come off and the reflation trade has come off. So I'd say for, for EM, what's really going to matter once the dust settles is which central banks are hiking. Uh, which, which countries will actually pick up from the, uh, the deployment of vaccines into probably non-China EM, because we are starting to see growth expectations in non-China EM rise, which is a good signal. Which countries will benefit from likely another pickup in terms of trade? We know that oil prices are suppressed right now, but there is not enough uh, supply to match the demand that we'll see over over the you know a couple quarters as we see oil prices move higher. And again, there's value. So this dollar move is creating some value in EM. So Russia, Brazil, Korea, those are three currencies that look like on the other side of this washout could be very attractive from all of those factors. Around the world with Mark McCormick. Mark, thank you. <laughs> Mark McCormick at TD Bank, global head of FX strategy. I repeat what I said and why it's so confusing for so many people in this FX market, Tom. Dollar index pushing 93. Last time we were near these kind of levels, it was the end of March. At the end of March, we had the highs of the year on a 10-year yield. Yeah. And now we're pushing back <clears throat> towards the lows of the year on a 10-year yield with the dollar index back to 93. Michael Rosenberg in his classic book on foreign exchange, John, I really can't say enough about it. He talks about the economic analysis of foreign exchange, the technical analysis, and then the back third of the book is on the mystery of just what you discussed, which is huge, ambiguous outcomes given the economic cards you're dealt. We have been dealt original economic cards, and we're living the ambiguity right now. The low of the year, incidentally, on a 10-year was all the way back in January, Tom. Euro dollar, Euro dollar back then was pushing 123. We had 123. Well, on we Euro had Jordan Rochester. Did I hear Jordan Rochester? 118 now, 117. You know, Jordan Rochester's talking a 110, wasn't he? Or was that you? No, I was, I was gauging, Tom, what it would take to get down to 110, just to war game things out with him. Take away the guess at a moment and just try and get into the factors that would take us down there. Euro dollar down to 110. German election in the mix. We need to talk way more about that. Lucky to have Matt Miller with us in New York. So we should catch up with Matt a little bit later in the week He's about in the New prospects York? of what would happen. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going for a drink a little bit later. No, I didn't know that. And also, <laughs> what happened here? You're going for a drink with Miller and I didn't get an invite. I don't know is, you know. is that where are you going for a drink? I haven't decided yet. Okay, that takes place this evening. Well, I thought you'd be in your surveillance nap, but we can arrange for that, you. That to that be takes there. place at midday. I can be there. Okay. You're well, gonna I come get... down to me or am I coming up to you? Oh, no, we're coming up. We're not I don't go below 59th Street during the week. Do you expect <laughs> me to come up to you? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, whatever. We can debate this Take another time. Bentley. Eight thirty Eastern time, Tom. That's when our full coverage will begin on TV, <clears> on radio, yeah. on Quick Take as well, of Jeff Bezos heading into space on Blue Origin's New Shepard. Yeah, well, this is the dark of night in Texas right now, and uh, they're, they're releasing out on the Blue Origin uh, website, uh, sort of getting ready for it, getting in the capsule, and, you know, we'll have to see what happens here in the next hour. Right now, I've got some big fancy feet up here, one hour, 20 minutes away, John. 35 minutes away from seeing the astronauts to be yeah. leave the training center.
Looking forward to seeing those pictures and bringing them to our audience worldwide in about 35 minutes' time. Let's turn to the price action for you. Get you set up for the market day this Tuesday. Got to stay on top of that after the week we had, the start of the week we had yesterday. 42.75 on the S&P, bouncing back 24 points, advancing 0.56%. Your bond market yields are off the lows. We had a little look at 116. We're bouncing back again. We're back to 118.21 on tens, just south of 118 on euro dollar at 117.83 euro dollar. That currency pair negative 0.14 percent, <laughs> three percentage points from all-time highs top on the S&P 500. Just pull the on radio, on TV, this is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerrans. China's rejecting accusations by the U.S., the U.K. and its allies that it was behind the Microsoft exchange hack and other cybercrime. Beijing says the U.S. and others ganged up on China and launched an unwarranted claim. A foreign ministry spokesman accused the U.S. of being the largest source of cyber attacks. Now, the long-awaited oil deal by OPEC may fail to prevent a supply squeeze. The agreement to pump more crude helps send oil prices tumbling, but the market watchers warn the increase is not enough to fill the looming supply shortfall. OPEC's own data shows the market will remain in deficit. That's until December. Here in the UK, the government has published a plan to overhaul the nation's power markets to prepare for net zero. Authorities say the plan would save $13.7 billion a year by the middle of the century. One of the cornerstone reforms could be an independent body to run the nation's electricity network. The government is also going to look at electric vehicle charging and large-scale power storage. Opioid maker Johnson & Johnson and three drug distributors are expected to come out with the terms of a $26 billion settlement this week. Thousands of lawsuits accuse the company of fueling a public health crisis in the U.S. with the painkiller. Bloomberg has learned that more than 40 states are likely to sign on to that particular deal. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Investors who are allocating to crypto know that volatility is going to be part of it. Most of the investors we're dealing with, though, are not looking at short-term price movements, they're not looking at short-term volatility. Their crypto allocations are really over medium to longer-term time horizons, so I don't think people feel terribly phased when they see, you know, sudden movements in the market like this. Always enjoy listening to Michael Sonnenschein there of Grayscale Investments this, from New York City. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning with Kenny Lyons. Lisa, back with us on Monday. You want to do Bitcoin now, Tom? Well, you, here? You under, Is that I where you wanted to I mean, go? It's under 30 thousand is that an entry point i have no idea you've got to do something with that cash let me pick up the pace and whip through this price Please. action just quickly thank Please. you your s p 42.73 on the s p advancing a half of one percent yields in early this morning we had a little look at a 116 now we're at 118.21 yields in almost a basis point tom euro dollar negative a tenth of one percent euro dollar right now 117.88 moving to blue origin at 8 30 and on to nine o'clock and a launch as well. First of all, we need to launch some perspective on the equity markets and the carnage yesterday. David Wilson is channeling another Wilson. That would be Mike Wilson, the chief U.S. Are equity strategist. No, we are not. Okay. <laughs> Wilson is a pretty common name, Tom, unlike, say, Keen. In any case, I digress. Uh, it's all about quality. At least that's how Mike Wilson sees right. it. Uh, initially, we've seen you know, a recovery in quality. If you look at the MSCI USA quality index, and it's based off return on equity, earnings growth, debt levels, you know, it's had a bit of a comeback after a year-long decline. This is very similar, actually, to the chart I talked about yesterday, S&P 500 versus the Russell 2000. <clears throat> this one, the MSCI USA quality index versus mm -hmm. the Russell 2000. We've seen a comeback. It's been led by tech stocks. They certainly fit the category. Wilson is looking for a broader move in quality, specifically some of the slower going companies. Uh, you know, think about healthcare, consumer staples, food, beverage, tobacco, real estate, 
phone right. companies. Those are the kinds of stocks he sees doing well going forward, you know, because he's concerned about, you know, slower growth perhaps in the economy. So he was looking at those areas and figuring the quality rebound goes on. The nature of the recovery, though, shifts away from the faster growing tech companies. Okay. Dave, we've got to leave it there just because of time, and we've got to go to West Texas All right now. David Wilson with the chart. We'll, do, we'll go longer. Thank you, Dave. Uh, tomorrow. David, thank you so much. Right now, Bloomberg Technologies' Emily Chang in San Francisco is in Van Horn, Texas, where she's had a very early morning awaiting Mr. Bezos. And her charm is she has known the Amazon story with our <laughs> Brad Stone like no one else. Emily Chang, you have a special relationship with Mr. Bezos. I want you to describe the amount of focus Mr. Bezos has on Blue Origin. Is it a third of his time? Is it half his time? Is this like everything he's doing right now? Well, it's everything he's doing for the next two hours, that is for sure. We are now almost an hour from launch. No indication that this will be delayed. Right now we are on schedule for 8.30 a.m. Central Time lifting off. What I can tell you, Tom, is it's been increasingly more of his time. What people don't know is that he founded this company 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a long time dream in the making. And finally, finally, he's hoping today that that dream will come true. And it is, you right. know, just a couple of weeks after stepping down officially as CEO of Amazon. Extend the dream out. This is a single stage rocket, 60 feet tall, and it's the first stage of the Glenn program as he moves from Shepard to Glenn. In two or three years, what will Mr. Bezos be doing in space? Well, he could be flying an orbital mission in space on the new Glenn rocket that Blue Origin is working on right now. The rocket he will be on today is the new Shepard rocket just going up and down right now. This is basically just a show of the technology for pr proposed space tourism purposes. But space tourism, getting private citizens to space just for fun, that's just a small part of the story. He's talked about building space colonies, moving big industry to space. He thinks Earth is the best planet. We don't want to move to Mars. We don't want to move to the moon. They're inhospitable. But we can help access resources in space like solar energy, like water on the moon, turn that into rocket fuel, for example, to improve life and our standard of living in the future on Earth. Emily, how does that differ with the effort from Musk from Branson? Totally. Branson uh, is focused wholly on space tourism. Branson's ambitions don't go beyond that. Elon Musk has talked a lot about Mars, about colonizing Mars. We haven't seen him go up on a rocket yet because he said he doesn't want to die on impact. He wants to die on Mars. Whereas, you know, Jeff Bezos is saying, we don't need Mars. We want to stay on Earth. It's beautiful. We love it here. We need to protect it. And over time, Earth's resources are going to run out. We need to find them elsewhere. And what he really wants to do, he says, is to build essentially a road to space so that uh, future entrepreneurs, future uh, business people can build uh, their own businesses in the space economy, even if they don't have nearly as much money as he has. So he believes he is paving the way for an enduring human presence in space, whatever that looks like. Their mission statement echoes that. This is it. I'll read some of it to you. Blue Origin believes that in order to preserve Earth, our home for our grandchildren's grandchildren, we must go to space to tap its unlimited resources and energy. That's the mission statement. Emily, he's not escaped criticism. This effort today is highly divisive. You're well aware of that. Is he tackling that head on? What's he saying about it? Absolutely. Look, he, he, he's been criticized, first of all, uh, by folks who say, look at all the problems on Earth. Shouldn't we be focusing on climate change? Shouldn't we be focusing on helping the homeless? Shouldn't we be focusing on all the people who need vaccines right here? And he <clears throat> says yes and yes. We need to do right. all of these things. We need to focus on improving Earth, but also focus yeah. on how space can help us improve Earth, if that makes sense. Now, Emily, in July 27th, when the Dodgers are in San Francisco and you invite me, John, and Lisa out, and we all go to the game. It's going to cost the same as amount as going into space. When does this become cost effective where mere mortals like you can actually pop up into space? Are you calling me a mere mortal, Tom? Well, Speaking when do we get down yourself. to a price point like Pharaoh can do, like 500000 <laughs> Um 
We don't know. Blue Origin hasn't given any indication uh, on the cost of a seat. We know that Virgin Galactic, of course, has sold hundreds of tickets for $250,000. We know that Blue Origin has sold at least one ticket for $28 million, <laughs> and that that winning bidder is not on this flight due to quote unquote scheduling conflicts. So it's a very expensive scheduling conflict, apparently. Uh, but all the folks, uh, as I understand it, uh, Bezos, uh, Mark Bezos, his brother, Wally Funk, who will go, go on to hopefully become the oldest person ever to fly in space. I believe her trip is comped. Oliver Damon's father, again, this, this kid essentially will become the youngest person ever to fly in space. His father was, as we understand it, the second place bidder when those schedules conflicts interfered uh, with that winning bidder's flight uh, so he is on that flight today Emily thank you I'm looking forward to catching up through yeah. the next hour our coverage starts in full in about 35 minutes time Tom can you imagine having a 28 million dollar seat to somewhere I, and you I, had a I scheduling conflict no. I, I, who is I don't it? get it we've got to get know. to the bottom of who this person John, is John Giants Dodgers July 28th the three of us Why out is in everything San we do about you and a vacation because it's we'll Filipino heritage night Filipino okay. Heritage Night, Giants, Dodgers. Okay, all right. Futures, 42.74 on Bloomberg Radio, on TV. Your equity market bouncing back five, six-tenths of one percent. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Right here, right now, in the very short term, we're in that frustrating pain trade. It's difficult to quench that thirst for yield given the very low level of treasury yields. As long as inflation remains contained overseas, you're going to see that global bond yields are going to remain low. No one's really defined what transitory is, least of all the Fed. It could last for a while longer, then it could start to impinge on consumer confidence. The idea, of course, is to get the unemployment rate back down to where it was before the next hit comes. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen, a simulcast, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and a different hour for us as well. John Farrow, the distraction of Blue Origin and New Shepard later in this hour, but first the distractions of a recovery from that horrific market yesterday. I expected more of a bounce on 10-year yields, Tom. Mm. I didn't expect to come in this morning and see them lower. They were. We're off the lows on a 10-year. Down about a basis point now to 118. And what a difference a price makes, Tom. When this price starts starts to change the views of people. Last week, we were talking about a hot labor market and Larry Fink's BlackRock raising wages by 8%. Fast yeah. forward a week, sub 120 on a 10-year yield, and people are talking about a looming growth scare taking things down. The headline with David Costin in our studios yesterday at Goldman Sachs, John, to me, it is a recalibration for the bulls. Michael Purvis led the way yesterday, 4,800 SPX. We get corrections sometimes, Tom. This is 3% from all-time highs. Terrible. I Crushing want to understand where the leadership comes from as we start to wait, make our way out of this. The likes of Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley has talked a lot about it over the last couple of months, and Dave Wilson mentioned it about 10 minutes ago. They've cut materials. They've boosted the view on Staples, Tom, and when things get tricky, get boring, and Staples fits into that. And Kaylee Lines, you mentioned Bitcoin earlier. I mean, there's a lot of different correlations going on now. We heard yesterday, Kayla Lines, a gold Bitcoin link is not, not so tight right now. Well, Tom, I want to know if it's a bunch of people who aren't sitting on a pile of cash like you are wanting to buy this dip in the equity market and then having to sell their Bitcoin to do it. But I think it does raise a question of when are we going to see a dip in the equity market that isn't bought? It just seems like mm. over and over again, it is buying of the dip. Is that narrative ever right. going to change? Maybe not. Below 30,000, 29,684, key support for Bitcoin this morning. John, we have to set up the rest of the hour before we Go talk on, markets with Alicia uh, Levine. It is a different moment. Are they pilots? No. Are they military? No. But it is four humans, John, into space. We haven't done that in a while. Are you willing to call them astronauts, Tom? I would. I. You're would, hesitant. You I can feel it. You go to 62 miles. On. You go to 62 miles as tourists. You're an astronaut. You go past the Kármán line. You've done it. No, I've not done it. But either is no, Richard you Branson. haven't done it. But you will have done it if you've gone past the Kármán line. Yeah. Tom, the amount of criticism <clears throat> of this event. And you, I hear it. You've been it. good about it. You've been good so about it. So many people that, John. reach out to us yeah. about it as well. But I want to make this point. Jeff Bezos' imagination is far greater than mine, and I put this out on Twitter in the last 10 minutes. I was the kind of guy that would have thrown mud at the online book Salaton with a ridiculous valuation. 
And on this occasion, I'll let others be that guy this time around. I don't think you want to be that guy this time. That when we look back in 10, 20 years, you were sat sitting here highly critical of this event, wondering what it could become, why we'll be doing this. I've got no idea what this could become. And I'm willing to try and be humble about this moment, Tom. That's going to be interesting to see in the early morning sun of West Texas. This is over the border from New Mexico, distant from Dallas, distant from Houston, is a very tiny rocket. The thing, John, that has not been reported enough on is they have scaled this thing for suborbital flight. It's not Saturn V. Apollo 11 to the moon and all that. It's not even Mercury Redstone of Alan Shepard, 1961. It is a 60-foot tall rocket with a little capsule on top of it. And in about 12 minutes' time, Tom, 11 minutes' time, we'll see the astronauts to be leave the training center for the launch pad. And then they'll ascend the tower in about 26 minutes' time. The launch taking place at the top of the hour in 55 minutes. Quite an event, Tom. Quite an event for this company. And we will uh, give you that full coverage beginning here in about 25 minutes. Right now, we are advantaged by Alicia Levine with BNY Mellon as we look at these equity markets. Alicia, did you go to cash yesterday? I did not go to cash. I got at my shopping list, actually. Um, look, as you've pointed out, we're 3 3.5% three below the high. That is not something to really write home about. And as you all know, the average drawdown in any calendar year is 14%. And in this year, we never got more than 4%. We keep on bouncing off that 50-day moving average. So if we, we do something worse, it would not be something so out of sync with how markets typically behave. It was pretty ugly, though. And, of course, the bond market is really leading this. And, and I think this morning's action suggests, if you look at the bond market and the kind of tepid action we're seeing from equities in the pre-market, I think there's probably more to go here on the downside. It's not fatal. It's just taking some of the froth out of this market and unwinding some of those trades that were really, you know, overworked, you know, all into cyclicals or all into tech. And tech was the last thing to come apart, which was yesterday. Where do you think the leadership comes from next, Alicia? And what are the signs you're looking for as we correct? So, so I like playing contrarian here. I think that even though we're mid-cycle, we're not early cycle, and we're definitely in that peak moment, as you've had conversations all morning about, we're in that peak moment, peak growth, you know, peak fiscal, I still think we have a ways to go on the cyclical recovery here. This is a good scare. Uh, I, I'll just remind you know, all of us that the U.S. really has exhibited really kind of an exceptionalism in the amount of fiscal policy, the amount of monetary stimulus, and also in the way we vaccinated the population. And because of that, I'm actually very bullish. I think cyclicals do work here. You may have trouble in the financials because of the yield curve flattening, but I think the cyclical recovery is here. We are not yet hearing about margin pressure. We're hearing about inflation, and we're hearing about the ability to pass on costs. So down the road, we'll probably have stickier inflation, but the margins right now are hanging in. We will learn more this week. If those roll over, I think you have to start heading more to your more defensive sectors, staples, utilities, and healthcare. But, but right I now, I, I would really go to the cyclicals because they've been, they've been destroyed. Yeah, on the margin question, though, we saw the likes of Siemens Energy. We've seen it with ConAgra. Those pricing pressures are showing up in a very real way. And when we talk about the ability to pass costs on, the consumer isn't necessarily having more dollars in their pocket to pay for all of these goods and the higher prices that they are faced with. Do you expect that to become a problem? And how do you factor that into allocating within a portfolio? So I, I think it's a bit of a dance. I think that we have to think about the stimulus that's now coming Further from the government, you know, 39 million households are getting monthly payments of child tax credits per child, $300 per child. So these are the households that have a propensity to spend, right? So it's not the high income households, high, in, high income households will save. The lower income households who are eligible for this will spend. So you do have some fiscal here being able to support the economy here. Look, I, I think margins are near their peak, and it's been very impressive how corporate America was able to survive the pandemic and retool companies. And I think you're seeing some of the benefit here in EPS. So EPS alone has gone up about 10 percent just for the second quarter as earnings season has rolled in. And that, that'll move higher. The concern is 2022, because as 2021 has moved higher, 2022 earnings expectations have not. Can that and, cyclical and so trade, though, Alicia, can that work at 118? Can the kind of things you're talking about work with a 10-year at 118? 
Uh, look, first of all, if, if, since we're at one eight, since we're at one eighteen, we're probably going to test one twelve because one twelve is the fifty percent retracement. So I think that's probably. In, in the ballpark here. But I have to say that on the fundamentals, I have to believe in the fundamentals. Yes, there are market moves, but in the fundamentals, we're still recovering and we're still recovering pretty strongly. And I don't see us going back to 2% growth next year. So therefore, I have to buy what's going to work in a recovering economy. We're going to get triple digit earnings earnings growth in the, some of these cyclical sectors. And I think you have to go there. Now, what else will work? Tech will work as well. We've got negative yields of negative 1.05%. When you've got negative yields like that, your tech is going to work because there is no alternative. So a lot of things work mid cycle here. I'm not scared. It is long overdue. Um, it's not surprising that COVID has resurfaced here. Yeah. But again, American exceptionalism will get us through it. And as a market matter, and I want to be very clear about this, I'm not making light of the health issue. I don't want COVID, right? We don't want COVID. I'm not making light of it. However, as a market matter, I think for the most part, the market has moved on and this will be seen as a hiccup. We'll move on and talk about space in a moment. Alicia, I've been meaning to ask this because so many listeners, viewers, people who watch Bloomberg TV reach out and ask, is that an Imperial Star Destroyer sitting just behind is you? Is that what that is? <laughs> It sure is. It's a Lego Imperial Star Destroyer, 4,780 pieces. And actually, one of my sons, sons wants to be an astronaut, and wait, he's learning wait, to fly wait, a Cessna. Wait, wait. John, John, did she spend the $28 million? <laughs> Was it you, Alicia? Was it Alicia? Did you, Was, did you, it you Alicia? Was this the scheduling conflict? <laughs> Was this it? Not, not me. Do you want to do a shout-out to your son, Alicia? I assume he's going to be watching this in about 20 minutes. That's right. He's learning to fly a Cessna. He wants to be an astronaut. And so I think, to see your earlier conversation, this is a wonderful thing for the imagination for our country. Our country produces people who imagine these kinds uh, of endeavors and puts capital behind it and does it and allows teenagers to dream. And I think it's great. So shout out to all the dreamers and the creators out there. I think it's great. Very cool. Who built the Lego ship? That's all we want to know. Did you do it or did your son do it? My, my youngest did it. Your youngest, my youngest did, it. did it. There we go. My youngest did it. Alicia, good to see you. Alicia Levine, Thanks. BMY Mellon, Wealth that Management works on radio. of Equities and Capital Market <laughs> Advisory. They just have to Google, Tom, what that particular destroyer looks like. Yeah, That's a big effort. How many pieces did she say? I, I, Thousands. She's a saint. I'll tell you. I, wow. never, I, I mean, Lego to me, you step on them all day. That, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I learned. Tom prefers puzzles. We had Lego you, boats. Tom and I, puzzles. Yeah, <laughs> Kelly, you've never been to Tom. Tom's house, have you? I have not. There's just guitars lying around on the floor and open bow bottles of stuff and <laughs> bow ties. Free and Mr. joining us shortly from TD, your equity market 4274. Full coverage of Blue Origin's New Shepherd launch taking place in about 40 minutes or so, 40, 50 minutes. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerrans. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has locked in plans for a cliffhanger vote today on whether to begin debate on the $579 billion infrastructure bill. Senators in both parties have not agreed on the measure yet. The vote puts pressure on the bipartisan group negotiating the measure, but Schumer also runs a risk of an embarrassing defeat. Now, the U.S. government is warning Americans to avoid traveling here to the U.K. That is because of a surge in coronavirus cases involving the highly contagious Delta variant. The warning came on the U.K.'s so-called Freedom Day, when pandemic-related restrictions were indeed lifted. Shares of Netflix just wrapped up their worst first half in, of, in five years. The video streaming company slumped 2.3% in the first six months. That's after first quarter subscriber growth fell short of expectations. Five years ago, Netflix shares recouped a 20% loss when strong subscriber results helped ease concerns. After the close today, we'll get Netflix's second quarter numbers and forecast for the third quarter. 
The biggest provider of hacking services is gearing up for several years of expansion in both the U.S. and overseas markets. Hallie Burton says it sees a, quote, unfolding multi-year upcycle. The company reported second quarter earnings that beat estimates revenue was just a short of those expectations. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. They're worried that the world is going to fall back into a recession or into a period of subpar growth with the unemployment rate elevated and with both fiscal and monetary policy tapped out. That's a nightmare scenario for central banks and their job is to minimize the chances of the worst possible outcome. That was Carl Weinberg, the High Frequency Economics Chief Economist and Managing Director. Some important images coming from West Texas, Tom, right on time, T-45, the astronauts to be leaving the astronaut training center and heading for the launch pad, Tom. And the new technology, John, a Rivian electric vehicle taking him out there. I think there's some real symbolism uh, to that and the technological envelope of Mr. Musk, Mr. Branson, and Mr. Bezos is as well. John, we go out 45 minutes for an 11-minute flight. And then in around about, what is it, Tom, 12 minutes time from now, we'll see the astronauts to be ascend the tower. Mm -hmm. We'll wait for them to get the go. They will ingress as you like to say into the ingress. crew capsule that hat should close at about 36 minutes past the hour and then the new shepherd launches at 9 a.m eastern time so tom t minus where are we now 42 yeah 42 uh for well, i got t minus 45 exactly here uh, as well we'll see uh, if that adjusts as well emily chang is in texas with tim stanovic and ed ludlow thrilled that they're with us today and we'll have some important guests including an astronaut to give us experience let us listen some of the cheers So off they go to the gantry, and we'll have much more on this. We're going to focus on the markets here. For those economics, finance, and investment, we'll keep the images up for TV, for radio. We'll, of course, describe this as well. Priya Misra with us uh, with TD Securities as well. Tri Priya, in the limited time we have with you today, you commit to steepeners. What is a steepener, and why is that the place to be now? Sure. So thanks for having me. Uh, the reason I like steepness is we're in an uncertain environment. Now, our view is that the economy is likely to continue to, to, to be strong, but we are transitioning, right? From peak growth, peak liquidity, we are transitioning to a moderate, still solid level of growth. But the Fed sees, uh, takes stock of, of all the uncertainty and probably wants to, and we sort of heard this from uh, Chair Powell last week, wants to exit really slowly. So I think that keeps the front end anchored. And if, in case the Delta variant does start to slow things down, you know, whether it's, it's lockdown related or just demand starts to slow down, that front end stays anchored. The long end is, you know, you, you, you really don't buy the 30 year as a hedge to equities. You buy the five year, you buy the 10 year. So it's really right. keeping that front end anchored till we know more about the uncertainty around Delta. The long end can then start to price an inflation risk you know, better growth. Priya, to me, when there's a little bit of sweat, a little bit of panic, it's not a yield analysis, but it's a price analysis. What is the character of the bid on uh, bills, notes, and bonds yesterday? Great question. I actually think it's very different from the dynamic over the last couple of weeks. I think the last couple of weeks was about a positioning squeeze, the unwind of the reflation trade, and I would say genuine confusion about the Fed reaction function. Yesterday was very different. Yesterday was about growth concerns, Delta variant, you know, are we threatening? I don't think it was about reflation getting priced out. It was about reopening getting priced out. So which is why, you know, you, you saw cross, uh, cross asset correlation start to break down. You saw the timing of the first Fed rate hike starting to move out, break even. So uh, tips break evens decline, not real rates. So I think now the market, the, the Treasury market has morphed from being concerned about the Fed to the actual economic outlook. And I think that's what's going to drive price action going forward. So what will change us directionally from the near term then, Priya? Are we going to be stuck here sub 1.2% for a while? 
you know, over the next couple of weeks, I actually don't see much of a catalyst to break us out. Now, we are looking for higher rates. We expect fundamentals to ultimately reassert themselves. You know, our view is that the uh, Delta variant is not going to derail the recovery in the U.S. But over the next couple of weeks, data is not going to tell us one way or the other. COVID infections might continue to rise. And so, uh, you know, I would, I, I'm actually concerned that the, the market might be stuck here for a while. It's really September. Let's see once schools reopen. Do people come back to the labor force? How is the Fed tapering decision? I think all that is a fall um, question, which is when rates can rise. In the near term, I'm more concerned about how much more position capitulation or convexity hedging, which actually brings more uh, you know, demand for treasuries. So we might be stuck here, low rates for a while. Everyone throws in the towel. That's when I think fundamentals will reassert. Does the dollar have any bearing at all to the moves we're seeing in yields now? I think it does to some extent. I would say, you know, if the, if the dollar strengthens too much, this is U.S. Ex exceptionalism. Yeah. You actually do see that U.S. growth then potentially bringing demand from the rest of the world into the U.S., into certainly U.S. risk assets, but I would say also U.S. bonds. So I think the, the stronger the dollar, it ma might sound counterintuitive, but it puts downward pressure on <clears throat> inflation expectations. It tightens financial conditions and actually prevents rates from rising too much. Priya, one of the main events this morning, the bond market, at least for market participants, We've got to get to the other one. It's going to catch up. Priya Misra of TD Securities, the global head of rate strategy. Just awesome pictures, Tom, coming from West Texas, about 30, 40 minutes away from launch time. And the scope and scale here is so important. I mentioned this a number of times, John, but I really I think it's worth uh, mentioning. Up we go 62 miles, a suborbital flight taking us back to not Yuri Gagarin, but to Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom uh, with the Liberty Mercury uh, a capsule. And this is so, so different. Not only the technological advance of 40 and 50 years, particularly in computers and in materials, but what's so important here, John, is it's just right size to go up 62 miles out of the tourism that Mr. Bezos speaks of. The astronauts to be, Tom, have just made it to the launch pad, stopping for a photo opportunity just before they ascend the tower. Expected to ascend the tower, Tom, in about seven minutes' time. So that's going to take place in about seven minutes. Then we'll wait for them to get the go, and then things yeah. get underway, Tom. A very fast 30 minutes approaching launch time. For those of you on radio, it looked like the gentleman from the Netherlands, a young kid doing a selfie there with the vehicle behind him, the SUV, and then certainly behind them, the, uh, the rocket is as well. John, I think what is so, so stunning here is it's not brand spanking new. The images we've seen in the last two hours in the early morning in West Texas is of a rocket that's been up to space and has come back down yeah. to be reused again. John, I'm still not used to that. That Everything separation. Everything's supposed to be new. I agree with you, Tom. And forgive us for going over old ground. I'm still stunned by that event. That separation yes. expected to take place at about 70 kilometers, 76 kilometers altitude, Tom. And then the booster comes back down. These four little legs come out and it touches back down and it's reusable. And that's what's yeah. really changed the game, Tom, in the last couple of years. And for everyone framing this as the billionaire space race, that's the innovation that's taken place, Tom, in the last decade. Absolutely extraordinary. And, of course, what's so important, I know we've got a good graphic on that. Maybe with these live images on for radio, we won't do the graphic. But it's a two-part landing, John, of that rocket coming down, the first stage uh, BE-3 engine rocket. And then X number of minutes afterwards, there's a small matter of getting four humans back onto West Texas soil. And those four humans, Tom, just exit the vehicle that have taken them from the training center center to the tower they will ascend that tower in the next five minutes or so full coverage begins in five minutes time right here on bloomberg tv and radio and for our audience over on bloomberg quick take alongside tom Keane, i'm jonathan farrow together through much of this morning with katie lines from new york city the eyes of the world on a small little town just outside of west texas this is bloomberg <laughs>